second sermon from Samuel. It's, it's been a bit of a toil this week, I've got to admit. I mean, I'm used to having um, portions of Scripture thrust at me. I was trained in the Methodist circuit, and you had to, well, I was a bit rebellious, I didn't, but you, you were supposed to stick to the lectionary every week and, and preach from the, the portion of Scripture that you were given. But it, it's a hard task. I mean, sometimes you're looking at it and you think, not sure what to bring. I've had the opposite this week. I've had 25 verses, and actually you could have brought four or five different sermons. So I've had to really be pointed on what it is that I want to bring. But to start with, let's just have a, a little bit of a recap on, on not necessarily what we heard last week, but where we are from verses 1 and 2. Ryan brought to us last, last week, and we heard much about the man Elkanah, or Elkanah, depending on however you want to say it. He was a nobody. An absolute nobody from the hills of Ephraim of Bethlehem. But the reality is that this nobody had been chosen of God for a very special purpose. And that was to bring this man Samuel into the world through his wife Anna. And we spent much time looking at that last week. But this week we're going to spend all of our time focusing on Anna. The rest of this, this chapter speaks about her, her toils, her trials, her torment, her crying out to God. And then at the end of it all, we see a change. So as Ryan said to us last week, at this point in time, Israel was finding itself in a, in a huge spiritual low. The priests were corrupt. We read about those in chapter 2, Hophni and Phinehas, corrupt as, you, as they come. The judges were dishonest, and, and in the main, idolatry was well practiced. And as it tells us in chapter 3, the word of the Lord, which was loved by Israel, the word of the Lord was rare. It was a barren land, much like this woman that we're going to talk about. Now just straying a little bit off what I want to say tonight, we have to recognise that we are living in a very barren land in relation to Christianity. We may have churches in every single county of this land. We may have churches in, in every city. We may have churches in every single village, but the reality is that the land that we live in is barren of Christianity. And that's where we find ourselves. But amidst all of this that we're reading, amidst it all, we read about a family, a man and his two wives and his children, who yearly go up to the temple, continuing in the things of God, they go to Shiloh to attend what is accepted to be the festival of the Feast of the Tabernacles or the Booths. This feast was instituted by God through Moses in Leviticus. And it was set up to commemorate and bring a joyful remembrance of the provision and protection and deliverance of God whilst Israel travelled through the wilderness. In Deuteronomy, the Feast of Tabernacles was reviewed, and we are told this in Deuteronomy 16, verse 17. Every man shall give as he is able, according to the blessing of the Lord your God, which he has given you. And when we, when we read this first chapter, and from the feel and the threat flow of the, oh, these opening verses, to me, it seems like this man, Alkanar, is in fact a godly man. He's not just going there to pay tribute because he's been told that's what he's got to do, but he's in and amongst all of this stuff that's going off. He's going up consistently, year after year, to worship his God. To observe the things, even amongst all the hypocris hypocritical generation and relig religious observances that he sees around him. And that is the stance that we have to take as we live our Christian life. There is much hypocrisy going off in the church. There is much heresy. There is much um, softness, if, if, if for want of a better word. 
And we must continue, as Elkanah and his family did, to go to the temple continually and do the things that we are supposed to do. We can't relax. We can't just sit back and, and hold off because God will use a people who sticks to the things that he has called them to do. I'm absolutely 100% sure of that. You see it in the word time and time again where God calls a people, God calls a person, he gives them instructions, they follow them. And what happens? Change occurs. Whether it be Noah, whether it be Mary, whether it be Jonah eventually when he has his arm twisted up his back, he go and do what God asked them to do. And something happens. So Anna, as we heard from Lion last week, was probably Elkanah's first wife. It was his first love, and we read that, we are told it in our context, that Elkanah dearly loved her. And he gave her a double portion of the peace offering. Even though she was just a, a woman on her own, because he loved her, he gave her twice as much. The name Amma seems to, be, seems to have been given to her prophetically. It means grace. So while she is highly loved lady in the flesh by Samuel, the affections of her husband, etc., we are quickly see as we read through this passage and we are told that she is graciously favoured in the sight and the purposes of the God of Israel. He answers her cry for a male child. And the prayer she prays in chapter 2, which does bear much resemblance to that that we looked at in Mary at Christmas, if you remember, shows us that Mary actually takes some of what she says in her prayer from this, what, what Hannah says in this wonderful opening chapter. So what is it that I want to bring this evening? Well, the title, if, if I wanted to give it, was following on from Ryan last week. Not only does God choose the people he is going to use, but he also chooses and ordains the circumstances through which he uses them. And that's what we're going to be focusing our attention on tonight. Hence the title of the message is, God uses the circumstances that he chooses. And that's vitally important. And we're going to consider four points. Hannah's circumstance and situation. <coughs> Hannah's response to those circumstances and situation. Hannah's prayer or vow. And then Hannah's change in countenance. So point one, Hannah's circumstance and situation. So for the sake of emphasis, let's just say it again and repeat it, Anna was barren. That means she hadn't had any children, she couldn't have any children. It's likely that she would never give Elkanah any children whatsoever. She'd been in this state for many years. How long? We don't know, it doesn't tell us, but from the fact that Penina has had several sons and several daughters, we can, we can imagine that maybe five, six, seven, eight, nine years may have passed by. And she finds herself in the same state. And let's remember that, that Elkanah only took a second wife because she couldn't give him any children. So it's been a long time. In normal everyday life, it's likely that Hannah didn't really have a lot to do with Panina. Panina and the children would have been in a, a different quarters and Anna would have spent most of her life with her husband. But the reality is, as we read in this portion of scripture, that every single year that they went up to this feast, Panina goes up with her children and rubs her face in it. She makes her life a misery because she hasn't had any children. And we must remember that in those days, having no children was a serious thing in the sight of God and in the sight of people. 
it was nearly unthinkable for a woman not to give her husband a male, a son. Unthinkable that he, he would not be able to have his lineage carry on because his wife was unable to give him a son. But it was even more unthinkable that a woman would not be able to have a child at all. She was an outcast. She was cursed of God, if you like, if she was unable to have children. Can you imagine how Anna felt? Every year this woman was going up to the temple and making her life hell. Rubbing it in it. Why? Because she was jealous. She wanted Elkanah for herself and, and she could see that he was throwing all of her emotions and all of his love on his first wife and she kept going persecuting her year after year after year on top of that she knew that she couldn't give him any children you know the women here would probably be able to understand that more than a man that actually the womb which has seeds there unable to produce it must be a very difficult situation to be in amongst all that we told something very real and maybe for some very difficult to believe. Verse 5 tells us this The Lord had closed her womb. The Lord had closed the womb. Now we have to decide how we're going to deal with this statement because it's plain to me the Lord had closed the room now there, there will be some that say well actually you know science hasn't caught up and there was no scans in those days there was no doctors that was able to get introduced into the situation and look at it well you know the people of the Bible only just said that as a as a, a way to say that she wasn't able to have children that God had done this to her there may be some that says, well, actually, God saw that she couldn't have children and used that situation. But the reality is that we cannot do that with Scripture. We either believe that the Word of God is the Word of God, or we don't. And if we don't believe it's the Word of God, then we find ourselves in a very difficult position. It changes the way we think about God. It changes who God is. And in reality, it leaves our salvation unstable. <clears throat> so what do we do with it? Well, if we're serious, if we're Christians, if we're Bible-believing and Bible-professing Christians, we have to stare this full in the face and we have to accept it for what it is. Now, for people who, who can't have children today, this may be a difficult thing. But God had closed a womb. That's what we're told. He closed a womb. Now, we could... We can look into our lives and we can apply so many different circumstances to this. And I suggest that, that we do that tonight with our own personal circumstances. Maybe we haven't got anything going off in our life at the moment. Maybe we, we're plain sailing and you know, we're sitting back and we're smoking the cigar, so to speak. But the reality is that at some point in our lives, there's going to be something that comes along and rocks the boat that makes us unsteady, that, that causes us to have these type of emotions that Hannah was going through. And what do we do? Do we say, well, you know, it's case or are, whatever will be, will be, or do we actually look back and stand back and believe what it is that we say, that God is sovereign, and that he is either allowing these things for our own good, or in fact, he's ordained these things for his greater purpose. We must be mature enough in both character and in the, in, to acknowledge in the word of God that those things which are allowed, those things that occur to us, are given to us by the hand of God himself. 
and more importantly, that for his glory. So what's Hannah's response to all this? And, and what should our response, how, how do we respond? I know how, how I respond. Sometimes it's not good. How does she respond? Well, I believe that we see two different types of response within one response, if that makes sense. There's a negative side to this, and there's a positive side to this. So we'll start with the negative, like Martin Lloyd-Jones always does. Elkanah asks four questions of his wife within this passage. He asked three why questions. Now why in, in, in this format here is a figure of speech which is called eroticis. And it's more of an interrogational statement rather than him just asking a question because he wants to try and establish an answer. He actually knows the answer, but he's querying why are you feeling like this? In other words, why? Why are you feeling like this? So he asks her, why do you weep? Why have you got so much grief over this situation? He asks her, why do you not eat? Why will you not partake in the double portion of the peace offering that I've supplied you? Why? Why is your heart grieved? And when he uses this word grieve, the idiom that's used is reflecting anger and not sadness. Why, why are you angry about this situation? And then fourthly, he makes this statement. And it's this statement that got my mind going for this theme tonight. Elkanah says to Anna, am I not better to you than ten sons? Is my love is me not being your husband? Is not me providing for you? Is not you being by my side all the days of my life? Is that not better than having ten sons? Panina would actually love that. She would love my attention. She would love my emotion. She would love my love. Matthew Paul interprets it in this way. Ought thou not to value my hearty love to thee more than having of as many sons as Panina hath? She would willingly exchange conditions with you. In other words, am I not enough for you? How guilty we can be at times of putting so many things not nice things, but the difficult things in front of God. All those challenging circumstances, all the hardships, all the trials and the tribulations that come our way, they, in the main, probably 80, 85, 90% of the time, will always supersede the praise of God. Challenge your own heart on it. I know that's the case because I know what happens in my own heart and in my own being. When Craig went to the hospital and he was given the diagnosis of what it was, the immediate thing in your heart, it's not to, you don't feel at peace straight away. There's a challenge there where you start questioning things and you start putting the situation above God. And here we see that Hannah refuses to eat. She refuses to partake in the peace offering that Elkanah provided for her. And I am suggesting that in these situations where we find ourselves putting these things above God, what we, are at, we tend to start then removing ourselves away from God. We remove ourselves away from fellowship. We remove ourselves away from prayer. We remove ourselves away from the word. And we find ourselves in a serious position and we're no longer that solid, stable Christian. Actually, we're teetering on falling off the edge of a cliff. And it's all about where we place those things in our lives. 
in grief we can be found turning away and even shunning his comforting arms in circumstances of trial and difficulty we can find ourselves not partaking in those wonderful graces that he's given to us and in the despair of our own circumstances we can even find ourselves becoming bitter towards others and angry towards God in those times I suggest that we reflect on these words from Elkanah not exactly but think of God saying this to you my child am I not worth more to you than all of these things or not you value my love and care towards you more than the circumstances and the trials of your life do you not know and recognize the blessings that you have as my children when others are perishing priorities how we view life so that's the negative side but I believe also we see a positivity in Anna's response and I believe that it's at this point that we see Anna's personal relationship with God displayed so whilst I've suggested that the not partaking of the peace offering could be negative response it can also be seen as an action of respect to the feast itself so in Deuteronomy 16 14 it was declared to the people that they should rejoice in your feast you and your son and your daughter your male servant and your female servant and the Levites and the fatherless and the widow who are within your gates this was a joyful occasion and it's possible that she did not want to partake and eat in the wrong manner just as we suggest that people should not partake at the breaking of bread in the wrong manner so that could have been what's going off here a respect for the feast we also see that Anna allows the rest of the company even her arch rival to partake of the meal before she goes off to seek the Lord in prayer and we should take example from these two things whilst we should not retreat from God as per the negative response we should also accept that the trials and the difficulties that we face in our lives we must deal with them you know we're not we're not Christians who pretend that things never affect us there is a reality about this life there is a reality about that piece of news there's a reality about that diagnosis there's a reality about not being able to have children there's a reality about being in poverty but there's a difference on how that becomes the focus of our lives Satan will use these things if we do not address them he will take them as a weapon and he will form it against God in our hearts and our minds and that's why we must seek God in prayer about them left unaddressed and unconfessed these things will only build up and create more of an issue within our life we need to bring them to the Lord in prayer so let's move on to the next point Anna's prayer we must take note of our Anna prays I don't want us to go into the content of the prayer I don't want us to look at the vow that she makes but how does she pray we can be left in no doubt that Hannah was bitterly affected by her circumstances we read it we can we can almost tangibly feel it with the words that are being used the tears that she is shedding so we know that she's affected we know that her soul was aching we know that she was in anguish we know that this was physical physically noticeable because 
in a prayer, she's in that much anguish that she can't even speak. And Eli thinks that she's drunk. So we can see how deeply affected that she is. But this is what she says to Eli when he accuses her of being drunk. Not so, my Lord. I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. What a lovely statement that is. What a powerful statement it is. Can it be said of you and said, it, said of me that we, we are willing to, to come to this point and pour our soul out before the Lord in these circumstances? We read it in the Psalms. The, the, the psalmist is weeping on his bed at night and weeping on his bed in the morning about circumstances and situations. And we must allow ourselves to do that. You know, what we're not saying is that we just ignore these things because they shouldn't be on our minds because we're Christians and because God should be up there and we just push all of our problems to one side. No. What are you going to do if, if you find a lump and you go to the hospital and they say to you, I'm sorry, Mr. Clark. It's cancerous. This is what we should do. We go to our Lord in desperation, in anguish. And we cry out from the very depths of our being. You know, public prayer in Israel was usually audible. However, Anna's praying was silent. It was from a heart. And a heartache was visual and she wept bitterly it says this this should be the way that we come to our Lord in circumstances in trials in tribulations so whilst we accept that God uses the circumstances that he chooses we have to recognize that if we don't take them to him, they're liable to cause a problem between our relationship with him. Paul tells us three times he pleaded with the Lord, and that's the word that's used, pleaded. Not that he just walked up to him and said, oh Lord, will you please, please take this away. No, he pleaded. It was affecting him. He didn't want it there. It was affecting his ministry. Three times he went. Did it, was it removed? No. It remained, but God said to him, my grace is sufficient for you. And we even read of our Lord Jesus Christ in the garden. He went back again three times. Abba Father, he said, all things are possible for you. Take this cup from me. Each time, he concluded, nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. Although we're not specifically told in this passage, we can make an educated guess that this was probably not the first time that Anna had gone to the Lord about this problem. I, I believe that she would have gone every single year and made a similar sort of petition. And in fact, I'm sure that she prayed in this manner before, to no avail. I'm even more convinced in my own heart that he, when she went away from here, she, she still didn't know for definite that she was going to have a child. But she continued. The reality is that although we may ask time and time and time again, 
for that thing to be done that circumstance to be removed that illness to be healed sometimes it may not be God's will and we have to handle that and deal with it and know that he is going to use the circumstances that he chooses and we, we were remembering the year anniversary of coming to this place last week and I was talking about Rachel's husband Lyndon in the final days of his life it was it was hard hard for Rachel hard for Lyndon who had been a, a man of God preaching for years to be lay on a bed unable to even lift his arms unable to speak and preach the word that he loved to preach we prayed for him time and time again take it from him allow him to come back to what he was and it didn't happen and what are we going to say are we going to are we going to say along with those charismatics well it, it's, it's got to be something to do with you it's got to be your prayer it's got to be something it's got to be failing in your area no as I said last week God used that situation and 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 had Lyndon not passed at the time that he passed, maybe we wouldn't have been here today. I don't know. But God uses difficult situations. And that's what I want us to really, really grasp hold on tonight. Because there may be somebody here tonight who is going through something hard and tough. Know tonight that God uses the circumstances that he chooses. That brings us to the final point. Anna's faith. Finally, in verse 18 of our reading, we see a key moment and a key shift. After finishing a prayer to the Lord, humbly correcting Eli about her supposed drunken state, Eli the priest responds to her, and he says this go in peace and the God of Israel grant you your petition at his word we read the following so the woman went her way and ate and her face was no longer sad There is no other place that I can end our time together than focusing on this verse. The reality that this, this word from Eli, which in, in, in reality was a word from God, and it changed the life. Faith came to her. And she walked away, bearing in mind what I've just said I don't think she was absolutely 100% sure that she was going to have a child but she went away in faith her countenance changed she ate of the peace offering and she was sad no longer the Lord is sovereign over all things his word tells us that and accounts that we've read such as this that of Sarah, of Rachel, of Mary they all tell us the same thing God uses the circumstances that he chooses even though we may not be able to see it at the time but what we can have is an absolute assurance that God is good we can have an absolute assurance that he always does good and an absolute assurance that he always does what is right yeah. always we don't have to just settle either for a blase statement to say well God's good God is always right and then actually in our heart and our mind have other things ticking over this can become a reality to us We can walk away from situations in our lives once we've been to God in prayer and have exactly the same faith as Anna showed here as she walked away from Eli that day. 
manna was given assurance by the priest and we have been given an assurance by a priest who is far greater Amen. the great high priest who himself is our peace who has broken down the middle wall of separation he's abolished in his flesh the enmity between God and his people the great high priest who has entered into the most holy place once and for all having obtained eternal redemption for those that are his and he now sits at the right hand of the father not just twiddling his thumbs but to make intercession for you if you are his child this evening he's praying for you he's keeping you and he's holding you and the circumstances that you are going through will work out for the good Amen. it is this high priest who after going to him by the power of the Holy Spirit in prayer will say to you go in peace and should that prophetic word from his mouth truly resonate in your heart you will go away you will eat and you'll be sad no longer are you assured of that this evening despite of your circumstances he will work all things together for the good of those that love him he will work all things together for the good for those who are called according to his purpose God uses the circumstances that he chooses so yield to him in faith and go in peace amen, amen. shall we pray <coughs> father we yield ourselves to you this evening we acknowledge father that we go through difficulties and circumstances that sometimes are beyond our understanding we, we sometimes find ourselves in circumstances and situations that sometimes we don't even feel or know how we're going to deal with or get out of or get through but as we've heard this evening father that if we come to you regardless of the outcome you will hold us and you will see us through and we have the assurance that you would work all these things together for our good father I pray that you would work that seed in our heart that we would know that we are truly children of God and truly inheritors of all things in Jesus name Amen, Amen.